Okay, so let's start. Well, hello everyone. Thank you for joining for the reading group today. So the paper that we are going to discuss today is since you are a simple framework for contrastive learning of visual representation. Well, first we'll start to look at ge the general context of this paper, then we're going to move on to the, an overview of the framework, and then we're going to study the algorithm step by step. The next section will present the main findings of the paper aside from the algorithm, and finally, we are going to see some performance benchmark of SimCOR. Well, as we all know, the main problem that we are having with supervised learning is that getting labor data is, is very costly and very hard. And the process of manually labeling data is very tedious, costly, and difficult. And at the same time, collecting unlabeled data is, is very easy. So the problem that our supervised learning is trying to solve is to find a way to automate this labeling process and take advantage of all these available unlabeled data. And generally, the self-supervised learning approaches tend to fall into one of the two families. On, the, on one side, you have the generative approaches, which mean we, we try to generate synthetic images to use as additional data to train the model. And on the other side, we have the discriminative approaches. And these methods usually involve a pretext task, such as uh, train the model to colorize black and white images, uh, rotate the images and train the model to predict the rotation decree, or uh, break the image down into a jigsaw puzzle and train the model to solve that jigsaw puzzle. And we hope that why teaching the model to solve the pretext task that knowledge can later be transferred into other downstream tasks like classification or object detection, for example. So inspired by recent advancement of the discriminative approaches, the researchers proposed SimCOR, a simple framework for contrastive learning of visual representations. The goal of contrastive learning is to teach the model to recognize what is similar and what is different. And we do that by enforcing the visual representation of similar images to be close to each other in the, in the featured space. So visual representation here simply refers to the embedding vector, which is the result of what we get while feeding our input images through the neural network. And the main idea behind contrastive learning is that if two images are similar, then the visual representation or the embedding vectors should also be close to each other in the embedding space. So here we are seeing an um, an overview of the SimCOR framework. Well, we start here on the left with an original images, uh, an original image X, and then we're going to draw two transformation from a pool of augmentation big T. We're going to apply these tr two transformation on our original images. That's going to give us two augmented version of the same image, X, Y, and X, J. And that is our positive pair. We're going to put this pair of positive sample 
through an by its coder and that is simply any kind of neural network and they use the uh, ResNet 50 in the paper. Next, we, we're going to retrieve the output of the last average pooling layers. That's it, yeah, the, how the model represents the images, HY and HJ. And we are going to fit this vector through a projection head, which is simply a multi-layer perception. And here in the paper, they use a very small and simple neural network with two dense layers and a radio uh, in between. Okay, so the projection head we're going to give it to a set, another set of embedding vector denoted by Z. And this is the vectors that we are going to use for our objective function. So this might look confusing at first, so let's walk through this step by step to see all the fine details. All right, so we start off with augmentation. So we have a batch of images. And for simplicity, we let's say we, we only have two images in our batch, a cat and an elephant. So for each image, we're going to apply two random transformation. That's going to give us two pairs, which contain two augmented version of the original image. So we have a pair of cats and we have a pair of elephant. The next component of the framework is the base encoder and the base encoder is, is simply the main model that we are going to use. So we've, we're going to give these augmented images to the base encoder and then we're going to retrieve the embedding vector, which is the output of the last average pooling layer, H. Then we're going to take this embedding vector H from the base encoder and put them through the projection head, which is a small, small, small neural network. And at the end, we obtain another set of embedding vector this. And that is what we are going to use for our contrastive task. All right, so we are moving on to the main section, which is how the learning actually happens. <laughs> Uh, Erico, can you remove yourself, please? Oh, sorry. Yeah, no problem. So we have a batch of augmented images, so a pair of cats and a pair of elephants and their corresponding embedding vector, Z1, Z2, Z3, and Z4. And what we are trying to achieve here is we want to for Z1 to be similar to Z2, why, in, why making Z1 different from Z3 and Z4. So we need a way of, we need a similarity score, a way of quantifying the similarity between the embedding vectors. And in the paper, they chose cost size similarity with an additional temperature hyperparameter tau. And the purpose of this temperature parameter is to scale the input and widen the range minus one and one of the cosine size similarity vector. Okay, so we have our similarity score, which is simply the cosine size similarity. So we're going to to put them through a softmax function. And this is simply very similar to what we did with 
a standard and classic neural network. But instead of feeding the activation through the softmax function, we're going to give the similarity score of the pair of images. And our goal here is to, to teach a model to find the similar images or the positive sample pair among all the other negative sample in the batch. So you can think of this as teaching the model to recognize the positive sample in the batch and forcing the model to be confident about the prediction just like what we did when we are using when we are using the the classic standard neural network with the activation and the softmax function all right so here's the the section inside the parentheses here is simply the result of the softmax function that we have computed earlier so we're going to take the negative log of that, and that's going to give us our final cross entropy loss term. So it might look a little bit complicated, but actually, it's just a regular cross entropy loss that we are used to see. So you can see there's a log, and they get an exponential, and we take the exponential of the positive sample among the sum of all the other images in the batch. So in the paper, they call this the normalized temperature scale cross entropy loss, uh, NDXN. But you might also know this with another name, which is the noise contrastive estimator. So we, we compute the cross entropy loss for, for the two images interchange that means that we're going to compute the negative log loss for each one of the two arrangements in the positive pair. Once we have that, so the final step is simply to loop through the batch and sum all the logs of the of each positive pair in the batch, and then we're going to average that over the total number of items that we have in the batch, and that's going to give us our final loss term. Then we simply need to update the encoder F and the projection hat G to minimize this loss, and that's the whole process of contrastive learning. So once we are done with the training, we simply throw away the projection head and use the base encoder for any kind of downstream task that we need. So that can we can fine tune that for classification, for example, or object detection. And one thing to note here that for the downstream tasks, we use the output. We use the embedding vector from the base encoder, but not from the projection head. And, and we will try to see why in the following section. So aside from the algorithms, the paper also highlights for other means fighting. The first one is about the impact of augmentation and the researcher noticed that multiple augmentation tends to lead to a better result for the unsupervised learning than using single augmentation. And also unsupervised learning actually benefits more from stronger augmentation than supervised learning. Whereas in supervised learning, strong augmentation can sometimes even hurt performance. Well, the second main finding involves the projection head, and the authors noticed that 
they get better results when they use the projection heads in training the model for the contrastive task. But using the base encoder for the Gauss streams tasks actually leads to better performance, and we are going to see why. The third finding, the third finding is about the performance of different loss function used for the contrastive task. So aside from cross entropy, there are also other functions usually used for this kind of task. And the, they find out that cross entropy gives a bad performance, but it also requires the Yaozu normalization of the embedding vector and the proper choice of the temperature hyperparameter tau. And finally, the author noticed that, as expected, unsupervised learning benefit from bigger batch size, longer training, and also deeper and wider network. All right, so we are going to dive deep into the first main fighting, which is augmentation. So the augmentation used in this paper can be broken down into two main categories. The first one is spatial and geometric. So inside we can see crop, reside, flip, rotate, and cut out. And the other family of augmentation is transformation that may alter the appearance of the images. So we can see, we can find here all kinds of color distortion like removing some color, changing the brightness, the contrast, the color saturation and the hue, but also Gaussian blue and cyber filtering. Well, here's an illustration of all the augmentation that were used in the paper. Well, one thing to note is that there are several things that they tried in their studies, but for the training part of the contrastive task, they actually going to keep only three of this augmentation, and that is crop with resize and flip, the color distortions, transformation, and Gaussian blur. And the reason for that is that the author did a study of com composing different transformation and they had plots the results or the top one accuracy of a model trend in ImageNet here. And they found out that using composite augmentation makes the contrastive prediction task much harder than using a single augmentation. So in the table, the entries across the diagonal are single augmentation and the other ones are the composite augmentation. The final column is the average over the row. And by using composite augmentation, we are actually making the contrastive prediction task. That is to the task of finding the positive pair among all the other negative examples in the batch much harder. And that's going to force the model to learn better the representation of the images. And also we can notice that in this table, that it one combination that really stands out and give very good performance and that it crop and color distortion and that is the reason why they chose to they chose this um, combination of augmentation in their paper and following that study they decided to study deeper the effect of of color distortion on the, the to see why it can improve the performance in a very remarkable way. So at the top left, they have chosen two different images, and that's spread over the two rows here. So the first row is the first images, and the second row is the second image. 
and they plot the pixel depth intensities over the different crops of the same image over the columns. So we can see here that on the left side with no color distortion, the different crop, crop of the same image have mostly similar color distribution. So it means that the, the our model can use the color distribution as a shortcut to bypass the contrastive prediction task. So to find out which one is the positive sample, which means which one is similar to the original image, they, the model simply re relies on the color distortion, uh, color distribution and pick out the image with the same color, the same color distribution and not really learning any generalizable features. Whereas when we apply color distortion on the images, the color distribution became very different and the model just can't rely on that shortcut anymore and it has to learn other high level useful feature that can be generalized to other downstream tasks. And the author also studied the effect of different value for the color destruction strength. And they found out that as opposed to supervised learning when stronger color destruction hurts performance, unsupervised learning actually benefit more from a stronger augmentation. And in this case, a simple combination of crop and color distortion can match the performance of the sophisticated policies used in auto augment. All right, so we are going to move on to study the projection head. And one question that you might have earlier is why do we use the representation from the production head instead of the base encoder to maximize the similarity in our objective function. And well, the author empirically show that using a projection head give better result for the contrastive task than not using the projection head. And the chart we are seeing here is, in the chart we are seeing here the green bar corresponding to the performance when we're not using a projection head. The blue and the orange bar correspond to the accuracy when we are using the projection head. And we can see that using a projection head give a better result. And the amount of choice for the projection head using a non-linear projection net, which means we add as a value layer between the two dense layers, give a better result than using just a linear projection head. And the, the other thing that it is because our projection head G is trained to be invariant to transformation of the images. So it only learns high level distinctive feature which is exactly what we want for the contrastive task. So we want the model to recognize if after the augmentation, even if the cat gets rotated a little bit or the color got distorted a little bit, but it's still a cat. So, so having the projection had really had that. Well, meanwhile, for the downstream task, it is better to use the, the representation of, of the embedding vector for the base from the base, in, base encoder because it simply contains more information than the embedding vector from the projection head. And on the left, we can see a demonstration of this. So the author have apply some kind of transformation to the images. So 
turning them into grayscale, rotated them, corrupted them, and applied cyber filtering. And they train a model to predict what kind of transformation has been applied. And they compare the performance while using the representation from the base encoder H versus using the representation from the projection hat G and using the representation from the base encoder H always give better results than using the representation from the projection hat G. And in many cases, it's quite a very big margin, well, around 40% gap between the two. And on the right seat, and TSNE visualization from hidden vectors for a random selected 10 classes from the validation set. And we can see that why we, when we use the representation from the base encoded H, the classes are much more clearly separated than when we are using the projection vector from the projection head G. So the other thing that it is because G is trained to be invariant to transformation. So it actually contain less information than the representation from the base encoder. And this information might be useful for downstream tasks because it contain useful uh, information about the color or really the orientation of the images. So that is the reason why we use the projection hats during the training for the contrastive task, but then we just throw that projection head away and only use the base encoder for our downstream task. All right, the next study involves the different loss function used for the contrastive task. And on the left table, on the on the table in the table on the left side, we can see that they have compared the performance of different loss function used for the contrastive task. And the cross entropy, we see the NTXN here, is the bad choice among the loss function. And they think it's because the cross entropy weighs the negative by their relative hardness and is the only loss function among these that do that so that's why it tends to give better performance than the other but at the same time using the cross entropy also requires a l2 normalization of the embedding vector and a proper choice of the hyper of a temperature hyperparameter tau so in the table on the right we can see that when we apply l2 normalization to the embedding vector we get a better result for our downstream task we see, which is the classification, top one accuracy classification on the image net. And different choice of high temperature hyperparameter tau can affect the performance by quite a little bit. So the last finding is about the effect of batch size, epoch, and network size on the performance. And well, as expected, using bigger and wider network tend to lead to improvement of performance for the unsupervised model. So the 4x you see in the chart here means that it's a ResNet 50 model with but with but with a layer that is four times wider than the regular layer so the wider the layer is the more parameter it contains the bigger it is so that's tend to live to tend to lead to better performance and the chart on the right show the performance with different value for batch size and epoch. And we can, we can see very clearly that 
using bigger bass side and training for longer usually lead to better performance of the model. So finally, finally, we are going to look at some performance benchmark of SimCLRs. So on the left is the result obtained with a, a company's use um, linear classification evaluation protocol. So the idea is, is to simply, it's a kind of bring your own pre-trained pre -trained model. And so here we have a pre-trained model, which is a frozen based network, and we're going to train a linear classifier on top of that. And, and the whole based network, which which you were pre-trained earlier is frozen. So the only thing that actually got trained here is the linear classifier on top of that frozen based network. So SimCRA outperforms the previous approaches like CPC, MoCo, or Pern, and while using a ResNet 50 model with a laser a layers that are four time wider is can actually match the performance of the pre-chain supervised ResNet model. And then we they run some additional experiments with SimCR by fine-tuning the whole base network with only a fraction of the label data, so 1% and 10%. And that's SimCR give very good result with very few labor. All right, so here are the sources that I use for this representation, for this presentation. So first of all is the paper itself, and then there are two excellent blog posts where I have stolen the illustration used in this presentation, and they are really helpful by breaking down the algorithm step by step with all the example. Okay, so that's it. Thank you for listening. And maybe you have some question that I might try to answer. Hey, Fan. Thanks for the talk. It was really nice. Um, can you maybe repeat uh, like really shortly about the like in one or two lines um, what is the purpose of the projection head? Why is it essential? I, I couldn't understand. Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, I was very confused about that part too. So, well, the... Okay, so here we have the projection head. So usually what we are, we, what we would do naturally is to you the representation from the base encoder h1 right here and use that for to compute the code size similarity and the author already did that and actually they found out that adding a projection had improved the performance and the way they explain that is because the representation from the base encoder H actually contain so many information and for the contrastive tasks. We don't really want to, to use these, the detail lines, the color distortion and the orientation of the images. So it's better to use the projection head just for the contrastive tasks so the model can learn the high level distinctive feature. And then we're going to just throw it away and use the representation from the Bayesian coder for the downstream task. And it just, they try that and they see that it works better than not using the projection head. And that's why they, they use it in the paper and they try to explain that with the experiment. Does it help? Yeah, it did a little bit. So in this experiment, I see clusters. Um, I guess it's different uh, labels. 
that's what they say that yeah the fertility as in they're actually trying to separate the 10 classes uh -huh. from the from the embedding vector so on the left side the a and a that is the representation from yeah. the race encoder. And on the right is the projection head. Yeah. Uh -huh. So the projection head is only useful for training the contrastive task, and it is not useful for the downstream task. Okay. Um, cool. Thank you. Do you have any other question? Thank you very much, Fan. Okay, so let's stop here and all right, guys, have a nice day. See you around. Thank you.